I'll start with turbulence as uh, we learn about. So I want to say from the beginning that um, the facts and laws of turbulence are challenging to interpret, uh, but they are um, abundant facts. And I think that it is reasonable to assume that many solutions of fluid equations are um, supporting the statistical, they are represented uh, in turbulence findings. So the statistical weight that uh, they provide to the laws is justified. So let's see now, I, I want to go down and it's frozen a little bit. Okay. So I think that, uh, so we start with turbulence. So let me remind you, um, the principle. Okay, so um, let, uh, please let me know if you don't hear me because the, the sound is now strange. That's good, we can hear you. Okay, so um, one of the first laws of turbulence named the zero law by Srini, Srini is very proud of uh, Srinivasan. Um, is the fact that um, the average dissipation of energy, uh, you can see my cursor, right? Yeah. Which is uh, the negative of the uh, rate of change of the kinetic energy uh, is uh, a constant in the limit of high Reynolds numbers. So we'll discuss this limit a little bit. So uh, if you have Navier-Stokes equations, which I'm not gonna write down, um, and uh, it, there is no forcing, then uh, this number is the average of gradient squared uh, multiplied by the viscosity. The fact that in the limit of uh, zero uh, viscosity, quote unquote, uh, you get a non-zero number, it might suggest singularity. So this zero law, so we're gonna talk a little bit about, about that as well. Uh, another law of turbulence is uh, the two thirds law written here that uh, uh, the quadratic increments of uh, velocity over a scale L, a uh, scale like the two thirds power of the distance between points um, multiplied by this epsilon uh, that's uh, assumed to be non-zero. Uh, this is supposed to happen in a range of uh, scales, not all the way to zero. And uh, the range of scales is terminated at a dissipation scale. And below it, uh, the assumptions of turbulence are that uh, the scaling is regular. So you will get a constant that depends maybe on viscosity uh, and you'll get L squared. Similarly to, to this uh, law, there is um, almost a consequence of it under some assumption um, is uh, the famous Kolmogorov spectrum that says that uh, the energy per uh, wave number uh, in Fourier space um, is of the type K to minus five thirds, the exponent minus five thirds multiplied by a prefactor, which is epsilon to two thirds again in a range of uh, wave numbers uh, related to, the, it's the inverse of the number here, related to viscosity and epsilon. So, and then there is also the four fifth law, which is actually uh, quote unquote exact, which says that homogeneous and isotropic turbulence, you don't need to know what those things are. It's just, you can think this as a story. Uh, the moment, the longitudinal moments, and mo most of these things are computed longitudinally. So in the direction of displacement L, the cube of that uh, uh, moment is exactly minus four fifths, that's, the, that's why it's called the four fifths law, times uh, the displacement magnitude. So actually in reality, this is done even with a sign. So you can put it uh, without the absolute value, you got the entire um, direction. So these are, um, as I said before, and I, I want to repeat, these are findings that are hard to interpret. And we're gonna discuss a little more about that, but you, it is reasonable to assume that many solutions of Navier-Stokes yield support, statistical support to uh, statements of this kind, modular approximations. 
So another fact is uh, intermittency. Intermittency uh, is observed numerically and experimentally, and it uh, also has statistical um, consequences. And uh, it's due to the fact that uh, the exceedingly high gradients of velocity, let's say, um, time or space are distributed sparsely and uh, unexpectedly, right, in space and time. So you cannot predict where they're going to pop. So in terms of the structure function, so if you take the displacement over a scale L to the power P, let's take it in absolute value because these are useful quantities to understand for a mathematician, then there are corrections to the Kolmogorov law. The Kolmogorov law would say that the exponent one third stays and then to power P is P, P over three. And there are corrections down for large P's and this, uh, uh, these corrections necessarily introduce the, um, let's say, uh, other constants, in particular, the, the uh, integral scale of the turbulence. So that's actually necessary. You cannot have a con um, uh, corrections without having additional uh, scale in the problem. So um, overall, the uh, rate of dissipation if it's constant, it is really related to the Reynolds number and the, the outer scale in this map, okay? So the behavior needs to be interpreted a little bit for mathematics and that's very difficult. So we have a Reynolds number. The Reynolds number is proportional to one of the one over the viscosity, but it has this mysterious U times L and you need to know what you mean by it. But of course, if you are in a, 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 a let's say, you are studying channel flow and you are having some pressure drop, you will understand it with external parameters. And that's the original um, motivation or the motivation for doing things in a wind tunnel. And uh, so the assumption is that flows, not only assumption, experimentally uh, observed by, by Reynolds himself, uh, flows with the same Reynolds number, externally observed Reynolds number, uh, have uh, similar behavior. However, for a mathematician, this is a not an, an obvious um, quantity. So let's do a little bit of mathematical consideration. So what are these braces? Okay. So theoretically, they should be expected values with respect to, um, I'm playing with you right now, a robust measure in path space supported on solutions of fluid equations in permanent state in the limit of infinite Reynolds number, okay? So those are very nice words. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, it, it is good to keep them like that, but let's try to understand a little bit in what order we need to take things. So we need to be in a permanent state. So we take long time averages of functionals and functionals by which I mean, you need to observe maybe uh, the velocity uh, at a point that that's a function, it's a delta at x, uh, but it can be other uh, objects, very important objects like the average dissipation in the flow. So how much, uh, how much does the motor heat up by, by trying to maintain um, the uh, velocity? So those are bulk quantities. So you take long time averages of functionals of solutions Navier-Stokes uh, we'll have to describe what we mean by long time and followed by the limit of Reynolds to infinity. And we have to describe what Reynolds is. So we might think that robust means stable, permanent means time invariant, and infinite Reynolds number means viscosity is zero. So those are useful, uh, how should I say them, marks where near there we should be. So stable, in the most generous way, it should mean uh, that they are, they are um, structurally stable. So if, if some measure uh, is perturbed a little bit and that measure predicted a K minus five thirds uh, exponent, then the perturbation should still predict, predict minus five thirds, maybe with the tweaks that the prefactor is changed a little bit and uh, the, the integral scale is changed a little bit. So at least certain things are stable. 
permanent means time invariant. Again, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that I take one solution of uh, one viscosity and take uh, uh, an invariant measure uh, associated uh, with that, which would be also very wonderful, but it could be also an approximation in the limit of infinite Reynolds number. So then uh, infinite Reynolds number needs to be discussed, but if conditions are the same, it should mean zero viscosity. So I uh, uh, said this many times and it's very uh, useful to remind that these are very different limits and they do not commute. So taking time to infinity first uh, or not to infinity, but a large compared to the behavior of the solution if it's not forced um, and taking Reynolds number to, to infinity uh, is they do not commute these two limits and we have lots of examples in which we can easily prove that. And uh, it's a very different ball game. And also the regarding robust, and this is uh, gonna be part of the first part of my talk. Um, you may have invariant measures of Navier-Stokes that give you the wrong answer. So in the particular case, if you think of taylor Quaid experiment uh, in, uh, in other words, you rotate a fluid in a, a cylinder, two, two cylinders, one interior, one exterior, and you rotate one of this, the fluids, at any Reynolds and any Taylor numbers, so any rotation and any uh, um, fluid that you put in there, um, the uh, rigid body solution is a solution, but it doesn't give you the correct um, or the observed or the 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 Nusselt number, which is the the um, so in this particular case, it's uh, the friction in the in the uh, Taylor experiment. So there will be the issue of perturbing some steady states and getting them to be quote unquote typical. And we don't know what that means. So in the talk, the, um, we, we do very uh, elementary things. As I said, the first theme of the talk is uh, uh, beware of forcing. So uh, you will see. And um, unfortunately, we, we don't have a very good understanding of, you know, originally the proposal going back to Kolmogorov was to take the limit of uh, zero noise. Um, even that is not clear. So finally, the matter of what happens if you have uh, forces, then the rate of change of energy is no longer the average only of the gradients of the velocity, but it's also uh, balanced by the, um, the work of the force. So what is then anomalous dissipation in this case? Well, here we need to understand that, that there are more ways of thinking about this. One way that people do uh, is to think about weak solutions. Weak solutions are a way to encode our ignorance. So, a weak solution is what happens, uh, functional analysis, when you use some properties that you know, and then you pass to the uh, limit in, um, for a long time, you get, you, you get some approximations. So those um, are not arbitrary, but in, on the other hand, they might at some point decide to execute things that are bizarre and do not belong to the, the, the real world. So it, it would be wonderful to be able to study all weak solutions, but sometimes you may have surprises that there are uh, um, you know, features that you didn't know before, and uh, those features uh, alter your notion of weak solution, introducing more, um, more knowledge. So uh, at this point, what I'm talking about is something much more modest. Um, we are gonna talk from inside the realm of uh, regular solutions, um, but we're gonna try to talk about, you're gonna say, see in a, a few moments about uh, accessible uh, conditions. So you, we're gonna explain that later. So 
let's start talking about the um, first uh, case in which um, the first theme of the, the, the talk is uh, essentially beware of forcing. So this is a result. And it's, uh, um, I, I put it in the, the Chime lectures from the Chime meeting from 19, and this is a very particular case. I'm gonna describe a little bit more about it. So um, you take an arbitrary domain in R3, you take a parameter, you will find solutions of Navier-Stokes sequences with viscosity going to zero, such that the uh, gradients multiplied by new uh, are constant. The solutions are smooth, C infinity. Uh, they have a Kolmogorov spectrum, even with uh, the exponent minus five thirds. Actually that's singled out as being the uh, an exponent in which there is no prefactor uh, like it should be, uh, no prefactor that depends on the R, uh, large scale. The force is smooth, compactly supported. The solutions are smooth, compactly supported in any domain. The gradients of the pressure are compactly supported. And these provide invariant measures because they're time independent that have these properties. Uh, and the only strange and unusual thing about them is that I manufactured the force. You will see how they are done. The construction comes from a very remarkable example of a steady solution uh, due originally to Gavrilov uh, with uh, Jun Hyun La and uh, Vlad Vikol. We uh, tried to understand it better and we did a construction uh, based on what it should be the correct, um, essentially, point of view uh, based on the Gratz Shafranov equation. So, but essentially, What's, what is done here, there exists smooth solutions of Euler, time independent, in a hollow uh, annulus. So uh, it's, um, I'll explain a little bit what I mean. The, the center of the annulus is, uh, is excised, center line, okay? Uh, and so it's an open set, it's a, um, in, they're axisymmetric. So here they're written in cylindrical coordinates, R and Z. The important property is that not only the velocity is C0 infinity, but the gradient of the, pre the, the pressure is also, the gradient of the pressure is C0 infinity. So it com compactly supports. So these are, allow an enormous range of crazy constructions. And that's what I'm, I'm gonna show. You can put them anywhere, link them or not link them, et cetera. So, Let's take uh, a sequence. This is already in that uh, Chime lectures, um, but I'm gonna elaborate in a second about them. This is not gonna be convex integration, okay? On the other hand, all convex integration is based on steady solutions of Euler that are very simple, like Beltrami fields or uh, the, these plug folds called uh, Mikado, because Mikado is the name of the pickup sticks in, in uh, Hungary and Germany. But um, so they're, they're plug flows. So these are not plug flows and not Beltrami. And actually um, they're not good for convex integration because uh, their Reynolds stresses are identically zero. So you take a sequence of points, uh, rotations, if you prefer SO3, that's fine, but I don't really need to preserve orientation. Um, numbers that are scales for you. And then uh, I associated a small L and the tau, which is the rate for just purely exponential behavior. So two to the minus L times J and two to the minus tau times J that for the uh, space and scale times. And then you rotate the uh, basic solution. So it's now, uh, its axis is rotated. You place it around the point X J, okay? And you rescale it to have, uh, to be tiny and high gradients. And then you multiply by a prefactor here. Now here, the prefactor, I want to remind you that this is Euler. So the prefactor could have been completely different at any number depending on J. And I'm gonna do that later a little bit, just a little. I'm not gonna waste a lot of time with this. So these guys have disjoint supports if you place them separately from each other. 
They are translated and tilted, hollow annuli, because that's what uh, each individual is. So you can think of string of lifesavers linked or not, okay? And uh, this is the remark that the total, that the tau sub j didn't have to be tau times j, okay? Uh, and the amplitude here, the LJs have to be small because you want to place them in various places. But the amplitudes uh, uh, don't need to be large. In other words, uh, um, the, the amplitude here doesn't have to be tau positive times j. It can be anything. So now the main point is that if you put these things, they have a linear superposition principle for nonlinear equations because they have the supports of their pressures are also the gradients of the pressure. They're also disjoint. So if you sum them, you get a solution of Euler, steady incompressible Euler. And now you can make multi-scale things because the J's have a different scale. So you can produce things at the scale, the natural scale of one guy is uh, two to the LJ. The, so the wave number is two to the LJ. You can compute the energy spectrum, but so in other words, it is the size of the thing per scale. And then you get powers. And by taking finitely many of them and making the entropy, the sum diverge, you can stop at some level and you produce these um, entropies that are, are uh, multiplied by the viscosity to be constant. And you get all these properties that I said. And in, it's interesting that there, there are parameters, but only the, the Kolmogorov parameter gives you an answer in which L factors out, which is the correct way it should be. And the smaller scale becomes the familiar uh, over a scale, and this is just numeric, the uh, mumbo jumbo, the, 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 the usual uh, dimensional analysis. So we can do a time dependent examples. So I'm going to do this quickly now and make one more comment. I don't want to belabor this because it's uh, the main point I'm making is once you allow yourself the luxury of introducing forces that you manufacture, you can manufacture a whole lot of stuff. So here, let's take now single scale guys, the guys from before, because then I can make them also large and small as I please. And uh, at each time between N and N, well, I'm gonna look at an infinite time uh, situation. So I'm gonna take a time between N and N plus one, and then do um, just linear interpolation between the two on that time scale. Then you get a uh, Navier-Stokes, with the force, of course, the force depends on viscosity and on time. With a, a pressure, which is the sum of the two pressures that you are discussing at that time, and then later the other guys. And uh, you can produce uh, the energy. Uh, you can compute the energy explicitly. It's time derivative is explicit, and it will telescope, of course, because we're with smooth solutions, so there is no finite time as, uh, anomaly. And you can uh, definitely put here the size of the single scale guy is in any uh, Sobler space uh, is arbitrary. I have a, I, I compute it here from the, let's say the physical scale of the L, it gives you a power here proportional to N, but then the time scale, or in other words, the velocity scale gives you any power you want. So a n is totally arbitrary. So, but if a n is in the scale that I discussed even before in the the finitely many in time independent ones, then you get that the energies are finite, the uh, entropy goes to infinity, and uh, the rate of change of energy goes to zero in time average. Okay, um, not difficult to do, and I would not encourage. But imagine for a second, only for fun that you take a sequence of these um, lifesavers, single uh, or multi-scale, and then you make an infinite sequence, two-sided Z, and then do a random walk on that. And you can accelerate the random walk. So you create a whole lot of forced solutions. The forcing is 
Now you can make it to be random this way and you can create all kind of strange and unusual behavior. Okay, I will stop with, uh, and I'm not encouraging this. I'm just saying in some sense, when we talk about forced uh, solutions or, uh, of Nabia Stokes, uh, it is better to talk about maybe generic forces or no forces at all. So it could very well be that there are the kind of forces that you, you do in, in, in when you are looking at, at gravity uh, driven or wind driven things. Those are, let's say, forces that you understand. They're large scale forces that you can model uh, and you can add to those small, let's say, unknown perturbations, but you shouldn't be uh, allowed to uh, manufacture your force or you can produce all kinds of interesting things. So now I'm going to go to the second part of the, the, the talk, which is, again, as I said, has to do with um, regularity and turbulence. So conditions for regularity of solutions of Navier-Stokes equations uh, in situations that you or uh, I might call turbulent. So let's remind ourselves now here the Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, the main point here is that in Navier-Stokes, as opposed to Euler, um, pressure is everything. I mean, I'm not saying that pressure is not everything in Euler, but it's a somewhat uh, uh, more contorted uh, argument there. Here, pressure is everything for regularity. So because in the absence of pressure, as you very well know, uh, there is a maximum principle. You are dealing with multi-deep burgers. There is no singularity. So um, the pressure equation is the same for Euler, Navier-Stokes, or hyper-viscous Navier-Stokes. So it's a, a very important object. And I am going to be interested in conditions for regularity in terms of pressure and in terms of structure functions. And I'm going to discuss them a little bit. So let's remind ourselves about the famous, I, I have been converted to call it Ladzhenska prodi serin uh, conditions, and I'm not mentioning Foyash, although she, Foyash was uh, at the same time in, 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 in this area. So um, I'm giving the, the critical conditions. So um, for time scale is two over P and uh, uh, space scale three over Q is uh, if Q, if this adds up to one, you are in a regularity regime if Q is larger than three. So uh, for instance, for the case in which Q is infinity, you get uh, this very pleasant integral of L, L infinity squared. And for Q equals three, it's a special case, and it's a scariaza seriogen schwera condition, I, I would call it, that, uh, that the essential supremum of uh, L3 finite implies regularity. Now, this implies regularity will be explained uh, soon. <laughs> so as I said, I want to talk about conditions in terms of the pressure, A, because I think they're, they're important, and also B, because they, they lead to conditions in terms of the structure functions. So what was known is a, a result by Berselli and Galdi uh, that uh, the pressure in L3 squared, uh, if it's integrable in time, then, then you have regularity. And the interesting and non-trivial result by, by uh, Serogin and Sverak that a lower bound, um, space-time lower bound for the pressure in price, so uh, which is, very natural. So um, the, um, the kind of conditions I'm going to talk about are going to be, I'm going to refer to them as accessible. So let me write uh, what I mean by that. So let's take the prodi serine condition with this, this quantity and give it a number. Okay, so suppose that you get uh, a number mq, you take a q larger than three. Notice that I'm not saying that q equals three is accessible. So uh, you take this integral and you observe it's finite, and you give it a number here. Then you deduce from this number that the entropy, the H1 uh, norm, H1 uh, homogeneous H1 in the whole space or, or uh, just integral of vorticity squared um, is controlled 
explicitly in terms, uh, if you go all the way to T, in terms of this number MK, MQ, with a coefficient that is known and this C is known. So what I call accessible are conditions that can be verified on an approximation that converges only almost everywhere. So when I, I, I talked about weak solutions as codifying ignorance, we actually, how do we construct weak solutions? There are methods of approximation that give you some information. Some of them are good for the energy. Some of them are good for the Helmholtz uh, conservation of vorticity. Uh, some are, none are good for both. Uh, and some are good for eigenfunction extrans like Galeurkins. So you have sequences and in the end, if you go for a long time, then the way you pass the limit at a minimum and pretty much always, you get um, almost everywhere convergence on a subsequence, not much. So you could control, however, using FAT2, if you, on the approximation, you get uh, an LQ norm doing something, then uh, the, this limit, which is a both weak limit in some function space and almost everywhere a limit, will inherit the FATU. Moreover, this guy will be inherited and the regularity will happen. So accessible for me means, A, I know the constants a priori in terms of embedded constants. I know that I pass to the limit in a, a, almost everywhere and I'm getting them and I'm getting the conclusion from them um, at the level of the anastrophe, okay? I don't need more than that because I'm gonna quote in a second the, the, the why I don't need more. So this is what accessible means. And it's important that I do not need to sample the weak solution in order to say something. So there are many results. First of all, there, is, there are results in the, this is not epsilon regularity. There are many results about weak solutions in which you put some information uh, on cylinders around one point, you assume a smallness there of some quantity, and then you deduce that on a smaller cylinder, you are almost everywhere regular or bounded. And then if these conditions in order to produce global regularity, they need to another uh, assumption, perhaps that that was the first singular point or some other way to aggregate. Otherwise you get just uh, partial regularity out of them the famous Kafferly con Nirenberg, for instance. So the reason why, um, what I mean by C infinity regular, it means simply that once you have H1, you have strong solutions. So if I have initial data at some time, which is in the H1 divergence free vector fields, then there exists a unique extension of that that is, L infinity of H1 and L2 of H2 divergence free. And then if there are no problems, meaning I'm in a domain, but the domain is smooth enough. Uh, I have forces, but the forces are smooth enough. Then uh, the solution is infinite. There are no forces, no boundaries or periodic. Then of course it's infinity. And if you want uh, even a very regular and so forth. So that's why it's enough to go to H1. And Accessible means I can do this calculation that is done uh, trivially here from uh, Prodiserin, Lagzhenska like Prodiserin to H1, and everything is explicit and it is um, verifiable on weak limits. So I'm not talking about weak solutions. What I'm talking about is the procedure that would lead to a weak solution, and G, it leads to a regular solution. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. It's a time interval T on which I have some regular approximations, some information on them, and only from the weak convergence, I'm getting regularity up to the time T for the Navier-Stokes solution. So formally, uh, 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 you can imagine the solution was already regular, okay? So I mentioned that the L3 norm is not accessible, so I want it to give accessible conditions. Uh, there, there is the analog of uh, the this for L3 norm is also true, meaning that if you put here instead of the pressure U to the power three, exactly the same condition, you get an accessible solution. Uh, uh, so let me write down what accessible means. Again, I get the producer now explicitly in terms of the constant 
that I am giving myself from the condition. And this can be computed in various ways. So what is the condition here? Uh, it's a finite uniform integrability. So it's what is finite about it is I'm asking that if the measure, if I'm getting you a number here, which this is uh, the constant in Morris inequality. Um, if the measure of my set is given to me to be smaller than delta, so this is the condition there. Is this a delta depending on this number? Not any number, just this number. So there is this a delta such that if the measure is small enough, I get the integral on that set to be smaller than what I need, okay? So if I have this condition, then this is based on L3 or three halves for the, the pressure, then I have prodicerin. And uh, once I have prodicerin, I have L infinity of L3, uh, I have uh, H1 as, as in previous uh, line. So condition is weaker than uniform integrability I insist because nu over C is fixed and it leads to explicit quantitative bounds on the astrophy. Now, uniform integrability, of course, is obtained in various ways. One of them is uh, you can have a, a, a continuity in time, then, then the path is uh, uh, continuous in L3 halves and then it's uniformly integrable. You can have piecewise continuity with uh, finitely many jumps or whatever. You can have time independent function in L3 halves that uh, bounded it. So uh, that's all those are sufficient for uniform integrability. This is less than uniform integrability because you need only a certain finite size. So you can write Prodi, uh, Ladyshenska Prodi sign for the pressure. So uh, this is, you know, it's surprising that they were not in the literature, but there is a reason for it. So uh, you can take uh, the corresponding condition for uh, in terms of the pressure uh, and uh, you get uh, L infinity L3. I didn't check that, uh, I didn't write down th that this is accessible, but I suspect it is. In other words, uh, I suspect you can get uh, higher than three here. But in the, the I, I posted a paper on the archive, I didn't check. So Q is allowed, Q is, infinity is allowed and you have power one and you get L1 of uh, L infinity condition for regularity. And now let's talk about the structure function a little bit. So all these bounds and in some sense, these are all based on the, the same, let's say cooking with the same, same water, all of them. So <clears throat> I will discuss a structure function that's not the usual structure function. So I'm taking the increments and instead of averaging at scale R with a one over R cube outside, it's one over R cube inside. That's a very big difference. And this condition, the way I think about it is that it is really incorporating the turbulence belief that Navier Stokes are regular perhaps not in a universal fashion and what emerges universally is above the dissipation scale. So um, this object I ca I'll call capital S2, it's logarithmically, uh, you'll, you'll see uh, some results are, uh, regarding this. So this is the definition of capital S2, it's the average of the increment uh, over a scale Y average in a ball of radius to R. So the condition in terms of um, this structure function is the following. You assume that there exists an R of T and this R of T is integrable to power minus four. And then you have the condition that the structure function, the finite uh, uniform integrability at the scale R of T and you assume that that is uh, small. So it's an L infinity with respect to, um, to this, but uh, time is hidden not only in the function uh, U, but it's also in the cutoff here. The reason for power four is simple. This is the, the limit. Uh, uh, this is uh, the, 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 the integrability of uh, the energy dissipation. When you, uh, you think of the energy dissipation as uh, being uh, gradient u squared. So you make 
the cut of uh, the Kolmogorov scale out of it, uh, and uh, that will uh, be uh, giving you this integrability. So this is accessible. So you obtain explicit bounds in terms of this delta, initial data in L2, and this integral that you're assumed gamma of t. Um, so by the way, all my uh, exponentials are non-dimensional. So when, when you see me uh, belaboring here with square roots and things, and uh, minus three to halves and things like that, is because everything there is scale invariant. So whenever you have an exponential, it should be scale invariant. So this is uh, the bound in terms of the, the structure function, and it has consequences, and I want to discuss them a little bit. So one example is if you assume a self-similar blow up, this, uh, these functions are functions of time, and you assume that you have a smooth solution plus uh, some similar structure uh, with uh, some regularity. So the regularity here is, in it's, um, this is essentially a, a Hölder, uh, a Bessel space kind of behavior. However, you please note that functions that have this increment, they don't need to be in L3, not even L2. So you can take a function that uh, decays very slowly and um, will have this property, okay? So of course uh, it is, uh, if it's the function is in L3, then you, this is uh, essentially the definition of being in the best of S3 infinity, okay? So if you are in this situation and you compute um, the condition that I said, you obtain the fact that if the Reynolds number in V is bounded in the profile, so the profile is a function that usually is time independent, it's just some function. So if its Reynolds number is bounded, then uh, again, if the collapsing scale is integral to power minus four, you get regularity in the sense that you can verify the condition of the previous, this condition, okay? Let me give a few more examples of how these conditions uh, can be interpreted. So in fact, the fact that we're, we're dealing with this integral under the, the averaging uh, is producing a, just a logarithmic uh, um, continuity, uniform continuity. So it's a Dini condition. So if you assume that the velocity has increments in L3 that scale, let's say in time independent fashion with um, a modulus M, then you need uh, the condition that the integral of m squared zero. So for instance, log to minus alpha with alpha larger than, than one half is enough. And you can do this with time dependent also. So this again leads to, so this is leads to the condition that I said before. Again, you can have on different LQs, so you can allow them to be time dependent. So the reason why this one was essentially time independent was because it was in L3. If you take uh, other cues, you can go essentially to the Prodi-Serin kind of, uh, kind of uh, conditions. So you assume a modulus of condition in continuity in LQ that depends on time. And then you need its integral to be of a, a certain uh, time integrals to be finite. So you get um, the analogs of the, the product. So these are, are all essentially applications. So I want to conclude with one application. No, no, first let me uh, uh, mention something else. So these were essentially looking like absolute continuity, uniform absolute continuity of finite scale of one, one size. But in fact, all the proofs use uh, bad sets. So sets of regions of interest. So all you need is actually the integral on that particular set, and that those are sets that are of interest for singularities. So you're assuming that you have a scale U of time, that you are looking at uh, the super level sets of magnitude and the super level sets simultaneously of the gradient. 
So it's a region of great interest and outside you are really sure that it's gonna be okay. You improve, of course. And if these conditions are satisfied and then you take this uh, condition, which is an integral of the increment, let's say the L3 based condition to two thirds on a small region collapsing at a, a fast scale, but not too fast. And you assume this uh, condition, then the solutions are smooth. Okay, so this is the kind of results that, that I'm discussing, that these are all accessible results, meaning that this condition can be verified and then it predicts quantitatively in terms of all the numbers that you put in there, quantitatively results about the entropy, and then from then on you can do uh, higher derivatives explicitly. So I want to finish with uh, uh, an example, a multifractal example. So um, let's return to a more, say, modest definition of the structure function, which is you take averages on a sphere at distance r, and then you call that S2, which is um, a very nice and healthy way of, of doing it. It's um, average, divide, you divide by the, the area of the sphere. And then you assume that depending on point, you get some exponent. I'm leading towards the multifactor picture. So you get some exponent alpha of x at x. Okay. So these are all time dependent functions. And I'm assuming that the time dependent function at some time has some exponent. And the time uh, is not written neither in S2 nor in alpha. Okay. At this point. So Big S2, the one that I introduced before, differs from little S2 in, in a situation like that by the fact that it has a one over alpha downstairs. That's the only thing that happens. So if I have a, a behavior like this for all R's between R and R zero, then capital S2 will have a same behavior with one over alpha there, which of course becomes infinite if there is no such behavior, which is uh, essential uh, in the whole picture here. So the multifractal turbulent intermediate scenario is assumed that you have a spectrum of near singularities. I say, I call them near singularities because it's really what, what the physics uh, means. So you have exponents H that occur on some state sets sigma H. The, the exponent, uh, the set has dimension dH, which is the intermittency dimension. dH is less than three, but it would be tiny, it would be uh, 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 zero. And they occur with some probability, uh, which I wrote, write d mu h. And uh, so now at each time you have this, um, this scintillation of sets. And, but on each set you have this exponent h. And therefore at each set you have something like this locally about the point x. So now, now I'm gonna make some construction, okay? So suppose I have around each such set, I have a region VH and I partition it in small disjoint cubes of size rho with rho less than this R zero. The multifactual assumption is that the number of such cubes is of the order, so I'm covering it, uh, and it's the order of uh, rho over to minus this dimension. And now I'm assuming that I have this information on the set, on the ball, on the small ball um, or a cube uh, around this uh, set. So I'm assuming, so this is an assumption because it's not, um, it, you know, it's, it's sort of I fatten the region uh, where the, um, the singularity is of the order it's not a singularity, it's a Hölder exponent of order h. And I say in the small uh, region around it, I can do uh, this and I get the exponent. So then if you integrate on the bad, bad set, intersect with this vh, you take uh, my favorite power three halves of this structure function, the biggest two, then I get some constant. And the constant comes because I count how many such balls I have. Uh, Elementary calculations gives you, uh, and okay, so believe me, rho is less than, than R0. You end up with an exponent three minus dh codimension plus three h, and then sum 
So if I take all of them, the integral on BU might intersect with uh, all the regions, I get an integral h minus t half with uh, uh, the measure or the probability they occur of this uh, power. And the uh, multifractal formalism says that the zeta p's that I'm discussed in the beginning of the talk are the infimum of these guys. So this in the end tells you zeta three on the right hand side on the bad set union, all these um, regions of behavior. But the assumption was that almost everywhere I have an exponent. So the intersection, the, the, the difference, symmetric difference between uh, the union and B has measure zero. So uh, all you have to have now is zeta three, not one as the exact solution, but strictly positive. And then uh, you get regularity. Okay, so there is a multifactual scenario with a little bit of grain of salt and assuming uh, this fattening uh, that exists, then, um, then you get regularity. So I'm not gonna talk about the proofs because I'm, I think I'm getting out of the time, but I'm gonna uh, just mention what they're based on. So they're based on pressure and the pressure has an associate object so this is the average, spherical average of the pressure. And uh, this is essentially the longitudinal component of velocity squared. Uh, I don't subtract anything. It has a long longitudinal com component, velocity squared. And this object has a local uh, equation. Because it has a local equation, you can do things uh, that you cannot do directly with P bar, but then this is benign. So the con the, the message is that you uh, add something benign to the average of the pressure and you get something better that you can control in the whole space and you can control it in bounded domains if you know the pressure on the boundary. And then you can do a decomposition in which in the decomposition you retain only B P bar as being uh, uh, the, um, let's say the, the good guy and then, and then pi you throw the other piece in pi because it doesn't really matter. So then this is the object of interest. And then you have that um, P minus beta vanishes for harmonic functions. Um, and so all the, all the uncertainty about what the pressure is, is hidden in P bar, of course. Uh, beta obeys good bounds and pi uh, has explicit integral representation in terms of, of, of the structure function that I discussed, S2. So that's uh, essentially where the whole, um, let's say I said I cook with the same water. This is all coming from this, this uh, representation of the pressure. So I'm gonna conclude here. I think I'm on time more or less, and I'm gonna recap. So two points. Long time behavior of smooth force Navier Stokes equations can be designed if you allow manufactured forces. And two, regularity conditions exist which permit complex, even multifactor scenarios. And I thank you. I mean, do you think there can be somehow a condition imposed on the physicality of a force um, which relates to how? What, how, what's the plethora of solutions that are admitted for such a force? Like for example, for Euler, if the force is zero, you have this huge family of stationary states. But if you start changing the force, then only very special things can satisfy the equation. So is there some kind of like a, some criteria that can be based on that type of consideration, selecting force? I, I don't know. I don't know. I think that the, the prudent thing to do is essentially to uh, deal with no forces and uh, uh, when uh, or with, you know, gravity and rotation and, and, and putting yourself in a frame or drop of pressure, things that are normal. Um, or if some results, it's very useful to know results that are generic. So um, that's also useful because you know it's information. But um, uh, to tell you the truth, I, I 
I haven't thought uh, about it, and I doubt that there is a very good way of getting uh, from the forest back. Maybe, maybe uh, there there could be something if you consider um, additional mechanisms. So there are many couplings with other physics that are very natural. For instance, Lorentz forces. Uh, 